Let on to the next sutta. 12.51. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. There, the Blessed One addressed the monks as monks. Noble Sir, those monks replied. The Blessed One said this. Monks, when a monk is making a thorough investigation, in what way should he thoroughly investigate for the utterly complete destruction of suffering? Venerable Sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One, taking recourse in the Blessed One. It would be good if the Blessed One would clear up the meaning of this statement. Having heard it from him, the monks will remember it. Then listen and attend closely, monks. I will speak. Yes, Venerable Sir, the monks replied. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So here the Buddha is asking the monks, nah, how should a monk nah, thoroughly investigate nah, so that he can destroy suffering? Nah. So they asked the Buddha to explain. Nah. So the Buddha said, Here monks, when he makes a thorough investigation, a monk thoroughly investigates thus, the many diverse kinds of suffering that arise in the world, headed by aging and death, what is the source of this suffering? What's, what is its origin? From what is it born and produced? When what exists, does aging and death come to be? When what does not exist, does aging and death not come to be? As he thoroughly investigates, or he thoroughly contemplates, eh, he understands thus, the, the many diverse kinds of suffering that arise in the world, headed by aging and death, this suffering has birth as its source, birth as its origin. It is born and produced from birth. When there is birth, aging and death comes to be. When there is no birth, aging and death does not come to be. He understands aging and death, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading on that is in conformity with its cessation. He practices that way and conducts himself accordingly. This is called a monk who is practicing for the utterly complete destruction of suffering, for the cessation of aging and death. I'll stop here for a moment. Huh? So here the Buddha says, huh, if a monk wants to destroy suffering, huh, he should contemplate thoroughly. Huh? He contemplates huh, what is the source of suffering. Huh? And then he understands huh, that uh, this world is suffering uh, because of impermanence. The strongest characteristic of the world uh, is impermanence. Everything in the world uh, is impermanent. There's not a single thing uh, in the world, uh, in the universe, uh, that is permanent. Uh. So that is why we talk about anatta. Anatta, sometimes people translate as no soul. It's a wrong translation. It's not no soul. It, is, uh, it means uh, there is nothing uh, that is permanent, uh, that does not change uh, according to conditions. Uh. If there is something that does not change, uh, then you can say, that is me. Right? But if everything changes, uh, then uh, whatever you take yourself to be, uh, in a while you will die. You will die off. Uh, and then you change, change to something else. Uh. So because of that, uh, the, the, this concept of no self or not self, uh, uh, the Buddha spoke, uh, it's not that there is no soul, uh, it's just that there is no thing uh, that is unchanging. Uh. There is no essence core in us uh, that is unchanging. Everything inside us uh, is changing. Uh. So we are just a flux of conditions. A flux of conditions. Uh. Uh, so uh, because of this impermanent nature of the world, uh, there is suffering because whatever we experience uh, that gives us pleasure, gives us happiness. Uh, we want to cling to it. We don't want it to change. But it is impossible. Anything that we are happy with, uh, it must change. Uh, even our happiness itself uh, is not permanent. Uh. So because of that, uh, when the happiness goes away, uh, then suffering takes, takes its place. Uh. So uh, this world uh, is a world of happiness plus suffering. Uh. So because of that, uh, we generally say it is a uh, uh, world of suffering. Uh, uh, so, and you cannot change the nature of the world. Uh, the only thing is, once you are, exist in the world, uh, you must experience 
uh, this uh, characteristic of world of the world uh, which is impermanence leading to suffering uh. so if you do you don't want to have suffering then you don't you should not be born into the world uh. the moment you are born into the world uh, this is the world of suffering uh. Uh, so he understands uh, that the origin of suffering uh, is birth uh. if there's no birth there's no suffering it's because there is birth there is suffering uh. Uh, so once he understands that uh, then he practices uh, for the complete destruction of suffering. How does he practice? That means he practices according to the Dhamma so that he is not born again. Then the Buddha continues. Then investigating further, he thoroughly investigates thus. What is the source of this birth? What is its origin? From what is it born and produced? What is the source of this being, this clinging, this craving? So, uh, these uh, 12 links, uh, uh, he, he considers uh, what is the source. Uh, as he thoroughly investigates, he understands thus, volition has ignorance as its source, ignorance as its origin. It is born and produced from ignorance. When there is ignorance, volition comes to be. When there is no ignorance, volition does not come to be. He understands volition its origin, its cessation, and the way leading on that is in conformity with its cessation. He practices that way and conducts himself accordingly. This is called a monk who is practicing for the utterly complete destruction of suffering, for the cessation of volition. Stop here for a moment. So here uh, the Buddha is saying uh, that when a monk uh, he considers thoroughly, uh, then he begins to understand that there are these 12 links uh, of dependent origination uh, that gives rise to suffering. Uh, and the ultimate uh, condition uh, is ignorance. Uh. From ignorance, you have volition, and uh, from volition, you have consciousness, etc. Uh. So, he, understanding this, uh, he practices uh, to destroy all these 12 links. Uh. Uh. In that way, uh, he can destroy suffering. Uh. Monks, if a person immersed in ignorance generates a meritorious volition, consciousness passes on to the meritorious. If he generates a demeritorious volition, consciousness passes on to the demeritorious. If he generates an imperturbable volition, consciousness passes on to the imperturbable. I'll stop here for a moment. So here, the Buddha is saying, uh, if a person out of ignorance, uh, he generates meritorious volition. That means uh, he generates good karma. Uh. If he generates good karma, uh, the consciousness uh, will bring him to a good rebirth. Uh. And then if he generates bad karma, evil karma, then the consciousness will uh, bring him to uh, this uh, uh, evil uh, woeful plane of rebirth. Uh. But if he generates an imperturbable volition, uh, probably meaning a uh, uh, high state of jhana, which is um, imperturbable, unshakable, like the fourth jhana onwards uh, is considered an imperturbable uh, state. Uh. So he will be born in that uh, realm uh, called the imperturbable realm. Uh. That means the high jhana heavens uh, there. Uh. And then the Buddha says, But when a monk has abandoned ignorance and aroused true knowledge, then with the fading away of ignorance and the rising of true knowledge, he does not generate a meritorious volition or a demeritorious volition or an imperturbable volition. Since he does not generate or fashion volition, he does not cling to anything in the world. Not clinging, he is not agitated. Not being agitated, he personally attains Nibbāna. He understands, destroyed his birth. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more for this state of being. Mm. Stop me for a moment. Huh? So, the Buddha says, huh, if a person is practicing to be liberated, huh, then he does not generate meritorious volition huh, or demeritorious volition huh, or imperturbable volition. Huh then uh, he does not cling to anything in the world, he does not want anything in the world, uh, then only uh, he attains Nibbāna. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he understands, it is impermanent. 
he understands it is not held on to that means it's not clung to lah. he understands it is not delighted in if he feels a painful feeling he understands it is impermanent he understands it is not held on to he understands it is not delighted in if he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling he understands it is impermanent he understands it is not held to he understands it is not delighted in if he feels a pleasant feeling he feels it as detached if he feels a painful feeling he feels it detached if he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling he feels it detached stop him a moment so here the buddha is saying uh, that this monk uh, whatever feeling he he experiences uh, he is detached from it uh. when he feels a feeling terminating with the body he understands i feel a feeling terminating with the body when he feels a feeling terminating with life he understands i feel a feeling terminating with life he understands with the break up of the body following the exhaustion of life all that is felt not being delighted in will become cool right here mere bodily remains will be left suppose monks a man would remove a hot clay pot from a potter's kiln and set it on smooth ground its heat would be dissipated right there and portraits would be left so too when he feels a feeling terminating with the body terminating with life he understands with the break up of the body following the exhaustion of life all that is felt not being delighted in will become cool right here mere bodily remains will be left and stop here for a moment so here this uh, Mang uh, was finished his work uh, when he knows that uh, the end of life is coming. Uh, he then he understands uh, that uh, following the death of the body, uh, uh, all the experiences of life uh, will become cool. Uh, so only the body will remain, uh, and we have not become liberated. Uh, we are passionate about life. Uh, there are so many things we are concerned about in life. Uh, but then uh, a lot of people uh, when they are dying uh, they think of many unimportant things uh, and they think it's very important they haven't done this they worry about their their son uh, who is not married they worry about this uh, they worry about their property worry about their young wife and all these uh, things uh, that are not important at all uh, because uh, when the body dies uh, the life uh, that we have led uh, will become like a dream that has gone by uh, every life uh, we experience uh, is one dream after another one dream after another and when it is finished uh, anything connected with that life uh, actually is not important at all it's just a dream gone by not important at all just like when we uh, dream at night uh, when we have a nightmare uh, in the nightmare itself uh, we are so frightened we are so excited uh, and we, and we, we we strive with all our energy uh, to either to to fight off the evil or to escape from being killed and all that uh. and then when we wake up uh, then we, we we think about it uh, ayo just now i so excited just now i so worried actually is nothing to worry about right so in the same way uh, life uh, and we are the life la we think that everything in life is so important but when we die yeah, all the things are not important what is important is where we are going for rebirth and that is important uh, so if we realize this uh, earlier uh, we would have started our preparations uh, for the next phase of our life la. <laughs> our people uh, you don't realize uh, that uh, to prepare for your rebirth uh, takes many years you know yeah, many years so you can't uh, like last minute uh, they're going to die in a few days time uh, you think what to do uh, uh, too late already uh. you need at least 10 years uh, to prepare uh, to get a reasonable good rebirth uh. so it's a thing to remember uh, when we are dying uh, or that has happened in life huh, will grow cold uh, not important at all what do you think monks can a monk whose asavas are destroyed create a meritorious volition or a demeritorious volition 
or an imperturbable volition. No, Venerable Sir. When there are utterly no uh, volitions, with a cessation of volitions, would consciousness be discerned, be seen? No, Venerable Sir. When there is utterly no consciousness with a cessation of consciousness, would mentality, materiality be discerned, be seen? No, Venerable Sir. When there is utterly no mentality, materiality, then there is no six sense basis, no contact, no feeling, no craving, no clinging, no being, no birth, and with the cessation of birth, there will be no aging and death. Lah. So the Buddha said, good monks, it is exactly so and not otherwise. Place faith in me about this, monks. Resolve on this. Be free from perplexity and doubt about this. Just this is the end of suffering. So the Buddha said, have faith in him. What he says is true. He is not lying to us. So in this sutta, the Buddha says, if we want to understand how to end suffering, we have to consider, contemplate these links one by one. That actually suffering comes about because we are in this world. But if we are not born into this world, then there is no suffering. And how not to be born in this world uh, is to uh, the source of birth, uh, is to stop the source of birth, uh, which is uh, being. And then to understand that being comes from clinging or attachment, uh, attachment comes from craving, uh, etc. Uh, then uh, that is understanding uh, how suffering originates and how suffering can end, uh, then if you are walking the path uh, to be liberated, uh, then you don't want to generate any volition uh, because you don't want to be attached to anything in the world. Uh, so you don't want anything at all. Uh, at 12.52 uh, at Savati, monks, when one dwells contemplating gratification in things that can be clung to, craving increases. Let's stop here for a moment. Uh, here the Buddha says, uh, if you dwell uh, contemplating gratification, that means satisfaction, uh, satisfaction with things uh, that you cling to, uh, then uh, craving increases. Uh. For example, if you have a big house, you have a big car, you have a lot of property and wealth, uh, then when you contemplate all your wealth, uh, then you are very satisfied. Uh, uh. But your craving will increase. Uh. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging as condition, being. With being as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Suppose, monks, a great bonfire was burning, consuming 10, 20, 30 or 40 loads of wood, and a man would cast dry grass, dry cow dung and dry wood into it from time to time, thus sustained by that material, fueled by it, that great bonfire would burn for a very long time. So too, when one lives contemplating gratification in things that can be clung to, craving increases, and from craving, you have all the other things, uh, clinging, etc. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. So here the Buddha is saying, uh, just like a big fire, uh, if you keep throwing three things into it, uh, dry grass, dry cow dung, and dry wood, uh, the fire will continue to burn. It will not stop. Uh, so in the same way, our fire is, uh, is fueled uh, by three things. Uh, just like these three things. Uh, the three things within us uh, is the greed, hatred, and delusion. So this greed, hatred, and delusion... Uh, will keep the fire burning, uh, the fire of uh, this uh, round of rebirths, uh, so samsara. Uh, so that's because uh, we are satisfied uh, with life mm -hmm. and our craving, uh, instead of decreasing, uh, our craving increases. Uh, anything in the world uh, that we enjoy, uh, uh, then our craving uh, will increase. Uh, and then our clinging also will increase. And then the Buddha said, Monks, when one dwells contemplating danger in things that can be clung to, craving ceases. 
the cessation of craving comes cessation of clinging. The cessation of clinging, cessation of being, cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Suppose monks, a great bonfire was burning, consuming 10, 20, 30 or 40 loads of wood. And a man would not cast dry grass, dry cow dung or dry wood into it from time to time. Thus, when the former supply of fuel is exhausted, that great bonfire, not being fed with any more fuel, lacking sustenance, would be extinguished. So too, when one lives contemplating danger in things that can be clung to, craving ceases, and when craving ceases, clinging ceases, etc. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Uh, see another sutta. So here, uh, the second part uh, is that when a person realizes uh, danger uh, in the things that he clings to, uh, then craving ceases. Uh. And what is that danger? The danger is that it is impermanent, and because it is impermanent, uh, it will give you suffering. Uh, I remember uh, last year I was talking to one, one of our Buddhist uh, supporters, uh, devotees in Kuala Lumpur. He had a son who uh, went overseas to study. And uh, I think he went swimming and he drowned and died. And because this man uh, only had one son, uh, I think one daughter, one son and two daughters or something like that. Uh. So when the son died, uh, he and his wife uh, felt so much pain, uh, so much suffering. And then he told me uh, something which just struck me. Uh. Mm. He told me uh, after that experience, uh, he dare not love the daughter so much. <laughs> The more you love, uh, when it goes away, uh, the pain uh, is unbearable. Uh. So because of that, he said, they not love the doctor so much now. It shows he's a, he's a smart fellow. <laughs> not, not many people uh, will realize this. Uh. <laughs> so here the Buddha is saying, that when one contemplates the danger uh, of the, uh, the clinging, uh, that craving, uh, that means that suffering will follow uh. Uh, then he lets go of that uh, craving. Uh. So actually, you see, uh, the best teacher in the world uh, is suffering. Uh, if we don't suffer, uh, we don't realize. Uh, so we have to suffer. It's just like uh, a small kid uh, tell you not to play with fire. Uh, he won't listen to you, right? He'll continue to play uh, until he gets his fingers burned. Uh, then you don't have to tell him. Uh, he will automatically stop playing with fire. Uh, so the world is like that. Uh, when we are young, uh, we want to experience all the pleasures in life. Uh, uh, we want to be a macho, we want to be a great hero, uh, go into this and go into that. Uh, and then when we suffer, uh, then we realize. Uh, but there are some people, and their karma is good enough, uh, they can get out of it. Uh, but uh, there are some people, their karma is not so good uh, when they suffer. Uh, they don't get out of it. When I was young, I had a neighbor, young guy, a young man. So he joined a bad company, ended up became, becoming a drug addict. Once you become a drug addict, it's almost impossible to get out of it. So I think he could be like one of those, just die on the five foot path on the roadside. So it's very pitiful. So if we get caught by this, uh, this state, uh, then we can't get out of it. You see Dana Sangita quite a lot of suttas or so. Try to go to one more sutta. 12.60 On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the Kurus, where there was a town of the Kurus named Kamma Sadhamma. Then the Venerable Ananda approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said to him, It is wonderful, Venerable Sir, this amazing Venerable Sir. This dependent origination is so deep and so deep in implications. Yet to me it seems as clear as clear can be. Let's stop here for a moment. So Venerable Ananda is uh, disclosing to the Buddha that uh, actually dependent origination is very deep. 
But to him, ma, it seems so clear, la, that he understands it so clearly. And then the Buddha said, not so, Ananda, not so, Ananda. This dependent origination is deep and deep in implications. It is because of not understanding and not penetrating this Dhamma, Ananda, that this generation has become like a tangled skein, like a knotted ball of thread, like matted reeds and rushes, and does not pass beyond the plane of misery, the bad destinations, the netherworld, samsara. Here the Buddha is saying, uh, this generation, people, uh, have become like a tangled skein, is a, a loosely called bundle of yarn or thread, uh, all tangled up, the thread is all tangled up and knotted. Yeah. So why is it uh, that Ananda is supposed to be a Sotapanna? Uh, and he says he can see a dependent origination clearly, uh, but the Buddha says, no. Actually, we find in the Vinaya books, uh, after the Buddha was enlightened, uh, then uh, even after enlightenment, uh, he wanted to understand dependent origination. And he stated uh, that he spent the whole night uh, from 6 p.m. until 6 a.m. Uh, for 12 hours. Uh, he was contemplating dependent origination, how suffering arises, how suffering ceases, and how suffering arises and ceases. Uh, 12 hours. Uh. Then only he fully understood. So you see, uh, uh, even Samasam Buddha, uh, to understand, uh, it's not that the, the uh, Samasam Buddha knows everything, you know. But a Samasambuddha or an Arahan, he can know if he takes the trouble to contemplate. So he has got to take the trouble to contemplate. So like the Buddha, his understanding of the dependent origination is much deeper than remember Ananda for the simple reason that the Buddha used his psychic power to see how beings die and pass away, how dependent origination works through many lifetimes. So because he could see Clearly, uh, contemplating the past, contemplating the present, contemplating the future, and he understood thoroughly. Uh, but it took him 12 hours. Uh, whereas Ananda would only understand superficially uh, what is around. Uh, he could see remember Ananda. But uh, Ananda did not have the psychic power to see the past, the present, and the future. Uh, they couldn't have uh, understood so deeply. Uh, yeah. And then the Buddha said, Ananda... When one dwells contemplating gratification in things that can be clung to, craving increases. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging as condition, etc., etc. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Suppose, Ananda, there was a great tree, and all its roots going downwards and across would send the sap upwards. Sustained by that sap, nourished by it, that great tree would stand for a very long time. So too, when one lives contemplating gratification in things that can be clung to, craving increases. Uh, and when craving increases, uh, then clinging, with craving as condition, uh, clinging uh, comes to be, etc. So this is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. So here the, the Buddha is saying, uh, just like a big tree, uh, its roots uh, will take in all the nutrients, uh, and send it up uh, to the tree uh, so that it will survive for a very long time. Uh. So in the same way, we are fed, uh, we, uh, we continue to survive uh, in this round of rebirths uh, because of our nutriment of greed, hatred and delusion. Uh, as long as uh, we have uh, greed, hatred and delusion, uh, uh, this will sustain us uh, uh, in the round of rebirths. Uh. When Ananda, one dwells contemplating danger in things that can be clung to, craving ceases. With the cessation of craving comes cessation of clinging, etc. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Suppose Ananda, there was a great tree. Then a man would come along bringing a shovel and a basket. He would cut down the tree at its foot. He would winnow the ashes in the strong wind or let them be carried away by the swift current of a river. Thus, the great tree would be cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that it is no more subject to future arising. So too, Ananda, when one dwells contemplating danger in things that can be clung to, craving ceases. With the cessation of craving comes cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of being, and then cessation of 
birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair. Such is the cessation of this whole man of suffering. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. So in the same way the Buddha says, uh, if we understand uh, these twelve links, uh, then uh, we have cut off this uh, ignorance. Uh, and when we have cut off this ignorance, uh, then the whole chain uh, slowly uh, uh, will break up uh, from ignorance. Uh, and this volition ceases, and then consciousness ceases, etc. Uh, so uh, that's the way uh, to end. Uh, so for, for us to do that, uh, then we, we got to cut ignorance, uh, we have to understand the Dhamma, and then we practice uh, to cut off greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, so I'll stop here for tonight. Uh. This, this sutta that I just read now uh, is, is often quoted uh, where Rabbi Ananda says, uh, Dependent origination to him is so clear, but the Buddha says, uh, not so, not so, that means you don't really understand. Yeah.